Can everybody hear me okay if I sit down like this? If not, tough. Um, <laughs> no, I will try to speak loud, but if I become difficult to hear, it is recording, um, I'll speak louder. If you can't hear me, just let me know. Otherwise, we move forward. So this is not the basket weaving class. Uh, this is the new paradigm on DNN theme development. And um, this has been a kind of a passion project for for our team uh, in Vision Native, but uh, uh, hopefully it's gonna open your eyes to a new way to approach theming that brings you into the current century as far as dev tools and things like that. So uh, by no means is this a beginning theming class but uh, or session, but it's uh, uh, still okay to start at this point. Uh, it will, I'll try not to get too, uh, too deep in the technical aspects of things. Of course, you've seen this slide several times a day already, but definitely thank you to all the sponsors, some of which are in the room, so uh, be sure to check their services out and uh, um, utilize them as a C-Fit for your projects. Who am I? Um, I am David Poindexter. I am the CEO. Uh, they affectionately call me the Geek EO of Envision Native. Um, kind of the tech head there, and uh, I'm also the co-president of Southern Fried DNN. I'm on the board of directors for uh, DNN Connect here. I'm also the lead for the DNN uh, Partners Ecosystem Advisory Group. These are all my contact and our company's contact information. Feel free to reach out in any of these means. So, let's start with the basics a bit because uh, we are going to be doing a paradigm shift here uh, in, in theme development from maybe what you're accustomed to doing for themes. So there are two basic approaches currently today in DNN to do, to do theming and we're going to utilize those. We're just going to use some more advanced tooling to help uh, our workflow be more efficient and uh, to do things in a high performance and optimized way. But the two basic approaches for theme development are HTML, which is token-based, so it's just pure HTML with some bracketed tokens in there that you can do, and then on the back end, whenever you package this up, or DNN translates that HTML into web controls or ASP.NET user controls, right? And the other approach is to use ASCX files directly when you're creating the, the theme, and uh, just go ahead and use those and, and all that. You may, uh, I put a screenshot, it's kind of small up here, but uh, you may recognize this tool. It's put out by 10 Pound Gorilla. It's a great resource to go to and see what kind of tokens or uh, uh, objects that you can use uh, for your themes and what uh, options are within those. The key building blocks for theme development, of course, are HTML. You're gonna have some flavor of JavaScript involved in it and some CSS and that's usually what all you're going to focus on. There are some more advanced things that you can do within the context of a theme but that will be outside of the scope of this session. So the, what is the old way of doing things? And I'm going to call, I'm going to refer to it as the old way because we, we really want to encourage people to use modern dev tools and to have performance as a, um, a mindset when you're creating themes because we do a lot of optimization of DNN websites, and one of the really big areas of concern or calls for lack of performance on a site is the use of themes and how they're built, how they're pulling in tons of dependencies, and some of them are doing it the quote right way, some are not doing it the right way in DNN. Um, sometimes it's out of ignorance. Maybe they do not know that, for instance, the client dependency framework is there to be able to leverage that and properly load a JavaScript file or a CSS file. Um, but the, the old way of doing it is manual. You're creating a file, uh, whether it be HTML or uh, ASP.NET user controls, and you're tacking on the features that you want in that theme or the design aspects of that theme that you need to put in place. So they are beautiful. Um, also, when we, when we think about uh, third-party themes that we're buying off of the DNA marketplace or somewhere else, um, they're, they're easy to work with in some regard. Most, most of them come with some sort of documentation that allows you to modify uh, the theme to 
suit your particular needs for that implementation, be it changing colors, changing fonts, uh, changing around the layout options. Um, some of them have widgets even in them that you can do that from an administrative kind of experience there and just drag and drop or change things. Um, that's kind of the old way of doing things in, in, in our opinion. So why would you go that route? Well, one, it is basic, so it's, it's fairly easy to grasp. The themes have definitely evolved as frameworks such as Bootstrap and Material and uh, Foundation and things like that have come along for the CSS stuff. It has evolved quite a bit and gotten more complex. Some themes have even bolted on their own functionality like a slider component or something that's kind of built into the theme. Some theme providers have even kind of bundled their modules in, inside of the theme. You know, when you buy a theme, you get module X, Y, and Z um, to, to use. But they're, they're, they're basic. They're easy to grasp because of either documentation or they're just quite simple in the way that they're built. So there's a low barrier of entry for using those. Um, one of the biggest reasons that you, you like these probably is that the tweakability, I call it, you know, of it from an administrator standpoint, you don't have to know any code per se to really make it what you need it to be for your implementation. So that is definitely a, a good reason to use these. And usually they're very feature rich. So you name a feature you want. If you want a, a card kind of layout of four things there, well, there's some way either via the CSS framework that you're using or with short codes within the theme or something that you can utilize to make that layout the way that you want it to, to look and behave. So why really do we need to change our way of thinking about themes? We, we like the ability to do all that stuff. They're, they're very appealing to us to, to go and get a theme like that and then tweak it um, or even build a theme that way because you can kind of get your head around it. But why do we need to change the, the way we're doing that? Well, one is to be sure that best practices are followed. Um, a lot of theme developers are not you know, pure developers. Um, they're web designers, so they know some HTML, they know some JavaScript, they know some, not all of them are like this. Some of them are real hardcore developers that know best practices. But a lot of them aren't implementing best practices with things. Um, things that, you know, they just may not know, it's just ignorance. Um, also, there's a lot of tools these days in, in the modern dev world that can really help your workflow to create something a lot faster, to be more efficient, to ultimately provide a better product and to make more money in the process of developing these things. Even if, oops, excuse me, that's water. Uh, uh, if you're doing this for internal use or external use, I mean, it, it applies to any situation where you're creating a thing. Uh, you want your developers to you know, have flexible tools to do it the way that they want to do it, but still following those best practices. Uh, you want them to be efficient in doing this why do we reinvent the wheel every time that we spin up a new theme or start developing a new theme? It, we find ourselves doing these repetitive tasks in a, in a process and are we as efficient? You may have a theme base that you're starting from and then you just kind of copy that to a new area and then you just start, kind of start building from there. Um, so we, we really want to be more efficient and we want to be more accurate too because anytime that we're manually starting over and doing something or duplicating an effort, there's room for human error, right, in that. So we definitely want to make sure that some of those repeatable tasks are done in a very accurate way so that we're not just overlooking something because of our humanness in it. But the big one, and I've got it in all caps here, not because I'm yelling at you, but, <laughs> but because I think we need to have performance. Um, how many of you actually think about performance when you're doing a theme? Okay, that's good, because uh, we really need to think about performance. Um, theme is doing a lot. I mean, part of performance is, of course, in the core DNN stuff, but the front end, I mean, all the JavaScript that you're loading to support whatever you're doing, all the, the CSS that you're loading, you know, minimizing things and, and all that, just making sure that it's all as compact as it can possibly be in the end is very important for the performance of the site. So what, what tools are available to do that? Um, there, there are some theme dev for, uh, that is more module developer focused, so 
it's tools for module developers to be able to create themes because they're coming from that perspective. There's a few of those out there. They're very good. Um, I wouldn't say they're using, most of them are not using modern techniques uh, for the most part. Uh, there are also some kind of modern solutions that are just pieces to the puzzle. And then we have Envy Quick Theme, which is free, freely available for you, and this is really kind of what the focus of this is, um, that uh, is kind of more of a full, I'm loosely using the word framework here, or a workflow that has a lot of stuff figured out for you so you do, you do not have to start with the complexities of setting all this up. It's set up for you and you can just roll with it by learning a few small things. Of course, if you want to make, uh, to get deeper into it, there's a lot there, it's very rich. But um, very quickly you can get up and running with a, a kind of a new workflow here. So how do you get it? Um, you see what I did there, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> G-I-T, get, yeah, okay, all right. I tried, I'm not a comedian. Um, we're, <laughs> we're, we're uh, the Quick theme is available on GitHub. It's free, open source project, and there's people already actively participating in making it better for the community and so forth. Uh, you can also go to mvquicktheme.com, and I'll show you that shortly, and it's kind of an example of the theme actually running. So, you know, with it being open source, our whole, you may say, well, why do we put all this effort into something this, you know, you may view it as complex, uh, a lot went into creating, but why, why in the world would you do that and just give it away for free or whatever? Well, one, we use it internally to help us with our client projects and our internal projects to create themes. So it's really something that we've been doing for a long time. We just refined it in a way that can be used in a generic fashion by everyone else, we figured to share the share the knowledge there and really put a tool out there because there really isn't a whole lot out there for themers. We've been doing it the same way, the old paradigm, for so long, and it's time we come into the current century with our tooling. But I'll say that you know many hands make light work, so if there is something, if you start using this tool, you're probably going to find little things that you would probably do differently, or you wish were there that are not there get involved. We're actively maintaining that. We're also accepting pull requests from people that have things that they want to contribute to it. So this thing can evolve and become even more refined and good. So what do you need to get this started? Um, and so, some of these things may be familiar. Uh, when you see this slide, uh, is all this familiar to most of you? At least you've heard of it, maybe? Or is this fairly new to some? Okay, so at least there's familiarity. Uh, how many of you use all of these tools on a regular basis? Nope, okay. So, you know, Node.js is something that we're using behind the scenes, um, ultimately really to run Node Package Manager, which is NPM, uh, to be able to get the things that we need to support the dependencies within MB Quick Theme. Don't be scared by these if you're not familiar with them. Um, most of this is really behind the scenes, things that you install, you leave it alone, you never really see it again, you just know that it's doing some magic or black cloud kind of stuff behind the scenes with it. Yarn is actually very similar to NPM. Uh, it's a package manager, but it's just a more modern and efficient, faster, there'll be something new you know, next six months, I'm sure, that'll come along. NPM 3 is coming up, so, you know, it's, they, they say it's gonna make yarn look silly. Um, but these are really just tools that we wanna stay current on to make things quicker and more efficient for your workflow. Um, Gulp we're using uh, for a lot of the build processes. So any tasks that you do over and over again, for instance, you, you're creating your theme and you need to package it all up into a zip so that it can install on a website. We're using uh, custom gulp commands to actually do that. Uh, just a command line, run it, and it's done, you know, in a matter of seconds. So no manual zipping up of things and assimilating this stuff and updating your manifest file, things like that. So any common task we're using Gulp for. So those are, that's the, the back end tool set that we're using for this. Um, so we're gonna kind of go over how you would set up a custom theme project. One of the, 
um, misconceptions when we first launched this, and it's probably due to our fault. Um, we named it MV Quick Theme instead of MV Quick Themer. We probably should have named it MV Quick Themer because it's really a tool set. Uh, you don't want to download the theme and then try to modify it. it. That was not the intent of this. It's really the tool set and utilizing that to build your own theme. So this is not a theme. It is a starting point for developing your own custom theme. Um, we, we used to buy a lot of third party themes as a company when a client project, especially lower cost projects where they just didn't have the budget to afford custom theme development. We would buy a third party theme and then we would modify that to fit the brand and the everything that we kind of wanted to do to the site. Well, we found ourselves getting frustrated because we would kind of do the same things over and over. We started using one particular theme developer because you know you you understand the way that they think or the way that they do things, you get familiar with it, so you do it over and over again. And you don't really want to move away from them because you'd have to learn somebody else's way of doing things or their architecture for it. Well, that bit us in the hiney uh, because uh, there, there came along a security vulnerability. Uh, so we won't talk much about that and who that was, but you know, we, we had to rethink the way we were doing things. And also we wanted to provide a nice value to our clients. We did not want the custom design theme to be a barrier for even some of the smaller clients, that, you know, projects that we had that weren't a crazy budget. And to be honest with you, now that we have the tooling, we're doing that happily and we're doing it quicker than we were actually doing it before with purchasing and modifying a third party thing. So MV Quick Theme uses three basic sets of commands. Um, there are the main commands that you have here. Uh, there are some, you'll use those almost all the time. There are some subtask commands that if you wanted to utilize some of the more feature rich or just individual pieces that uh, you want to do, uh, you could do that. And then there are some, some low level process commands that ultimately are what's being called in these higher level commands. But um, you can really be up and out of the box running in no time by just learning the main commands. We, um, we right now the, the initial build of this, the idea was it for it to be framework agnostic um, so that if you did not want to use Bootstrap, you wanted to use foundation or um, material, some flavor of material or something like that, that you could. You theoretically can do that, but we don't have it very easy right now to just kind of flip a switch and change. So for right now, uh, there's Bootstrap built into it and there is Font Awesome for Icon Library built into it. Seems to be the more popular frameworks right now uh, for, for CSS and icons. Another tool that can be helpful, you know, shameless plug here, but MV Quick Sight, um, when you're developing themes locally, you can utilize MV Quick Sight, spin up a quick local instance to develop against either inside of that instance or disconnected. And I'll show you a nice trick to do disconnected as well. Um, I'll explain what I mean by that. But if you haven't heard of MV Quick Sight, you can go to mvquicksight.com. It's an installer for DNN. Whatever version of DNN you want to build against, you just choose that option. And in less than a minute, if you have the prerequisites on your machine, in less than a minute, you can have DNN up and running. So unless you have configuration issues or something like that, right? <laughs> so, uh, but again, it's another tool that's also open source and freely available out there that we contributed to the, contributed to the community because we got tired of manually doing this all the time. Some people have built PowerShell scripts and things like that to kind of spin up their own environments, but honestly, we, we built this so we could just use it over and over and why not share the, share the, um, the benefit there with the, the greater community. So let's uh, switch over and see some of this in action. Uh, I want to spend most of the time here really kind of digging into things. Uh, I'd like for this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have a question as we go through this or a comment or something you see that could be better, go ahead and inject as we're going through it. So I'm going to switch over and this is mequickthing.com right here. So out of the box, you're going to get a theme that looks like this. Again, the intent is not that you use this theme, 
but yet you modify this, make some simple adjustments, do what you need to do to build your own theme. But out of the box, you get a nice theme. Uh, you'll notice some things in here that are, and by the way, I probably should just load this site again. And um, it, you couldn't see it because it just blipped, but that's how fast the site loads. Granted, we don't have any craziness going on on the site, but I should probably pull this up. That loaded in 0.64 seconds. So when we think about optimization, um, your scores on you know, web page speed insight or uh, Google page speed insights or web page test or whatever tool that you're using, why slow or something like that, you're gonna see right out of the box something that is incredibly high performance there. We took it as far as we could take it within the context of what DNN allows us to do right now. So there are definitely some enhancements that can be made on the DNN side to help things, but uh, we've taken the theme aspect of it as, as far as we can at this point. So you can see um, probably one of the biggest differences you'll see that's not common in some of the themes is we have the menu. This is uh, actually a very lightweight menu, JavaScript menu called Slim Menu. This is one of the very few external dependencies that we have. We tried to have as little dependencies on other things as possible. So really it's the Slim Menu, Bootstrap, and Font Awesome, and that's it. Everything else is pure inside of the theme, so we're not loading. JavaScript-based menu. Yes. And no CSS-based. Uh, well, it's CSS, but uh, the actual menu functionality itself is, yes. in, is in JavaScript, yes. You can absolutely style it, though. It's fully stylable. It's, it's very flexible, but um, you'll notice it has a split menu option, which is kind of nice because, um, especially on mobile devices, you know how you, you, you click something, and you have to click it twice in a submenu to get it to actually go to the page. Well, this has a one-click option here, you know, for this. But in here, if you were on a mobile device, you would click the down arrow to actually expand it, and then you click it. So it's still a one-click on the actual page itself. So we kind of like that. But um, right out of the box, if you you know want a high performance. Uh, menu, we're not bloating it with all the fanciness of animation and things like that in here. So, so it's pretty clean uh, looking right here. So we got definitely some content on the page and some images. Um, our scores right out of the box on Google PageSpeed Insights is 93 on desktop and 73 on mobile. The reason the 73 there is actually on mobile is actually a content issue, not a theme issue. It's an above, above the fold thing for this big banner up here. Um, they penalize us a little bit for that, but uh, we figured it was more important to make it look good in this case than to get a little bit higher score. So, all right, so we'll switch over to, I wanna point out the GitHub site. Um, we're at github.com slash envisionative NV quick theme. This is where the project project resides, and you'll see there's a, a quite in-depth wiki here, which you can also get to from the README file, but um, here you'll see a nice intro of what, we, what our goals were in creating this and some of the background and what some of the scoring is. But over on the right, you'll see installation steps, what you need to get up and running. So here, what you'll see is you would have to clone the repository Okay, you can do that either by downloading the zip and unzipping it, or if you're a Git person and you know the Git command line stuff, you can just clone the repository, or if you are using some other tool like a source tree or something like, or, or Git for Windows or for Mac, you could do that. Um, you would need to install Node, and you can do that simply going to nodejs.org and installing the appropriate uh, we, we recommend the LTS, the latest stable, uh, well, LS, what is that, L latest? The latest, the latest stable release. Yes, yeah, the latest stable release, but is it LTS or L? Anyways. Long-term support? Long-term support, that's it, yes, yes, yeah. Also the most stable that they're supporting. So um, we recommend that one, um, and you can always update that. But again, this is something that you're installing and really leaving it alone. It's not like you have to learn Node or anything. It'll run fine on Windows, it'll run fine on Mac. Then we want uh, to install NPM. Now, that actually is distributed with the Node.js, um, but it depends on exactly how you install it. If you download their installer, 
uh, for Windows or Mac, it's going to be included in that by default. Uh, but if you get node some other means, if you go to some repo, you may or may not have NPM in there. Um, so you, your installation may vary if, depending on where you get it. But if you just get it from nodejs.org, from their download, I'll just go ahead and open this up. So right here on the, on the home page, you can get the LTS release. If you get this, it's gonna detect what platform you're actually on and offer that to you. If you install that, you'll have NPM already. And at that point, we want to install Yarn. Now, there, depending on which OS you're on, it may vary. Uh, on Windows, it's actually a little bit easier to install Yarn, but you can go to the Yarn installation page and it will tell you exactly how to do it for your particular platform and so forth. So it, it detected, we, we use Homebrew on a Mac like this. Uh, on PC, it's actually a little bit easier. And uh, this is probably the hardest part of getting set up. By the way, once you go through this initial setup, you don't have to do that every single time. You're, you're installing this stuff in a global kind of fashion, so you don't have to worry about ever doing it again once you do it. And the last thing you want to do is install Gulp. And since you'll have no package manager on there, you'll just run this command npm install gulp g for global. Otherwise, it's just going to install it in the directory that you're running the command from. Once you've done that, you're good. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to flip flop here a little bit between my notes just to make sure I follow the order I wanted to do. So uh, we went over the prerequisite, prerequisites there um, for Node and NPM and uh, Yarn and Gulp. And then, so we talked a little bit about MV QuickSight, but there's really a couple ways you can do your, well, really three ways you can do your development. You can set it up, you can set up a local instance of DNN. I'm on a Mac, so I, I don't have a local instance set up right here. But you can set it up there and you can work right out of the portals, underscore default, uh, skins folder, and you create your own skin folder there. You can work right there so that you can actually have a live site and see the changes uh, right there. Some people do not like to develop inline. We, pers we, per we don't do that. We usually have multiple instances of DNN on there and we want to test it on different versions and not have to develop inside any DNN instance. So we use a, a nifty little tool that's built right into um, Windows, Windows 10, and it's called MakeLink, MKLink. But you can uh, take down, uh, I can share this uh, address with you or you can just take a chance to write it down. It's a little bit long, but if you just do a Google search on the MK link, it'll tell you. And what this does is it's making a kind of a, a virtual link or a, a shadow link is kind of what they're talk, talking about here uh, between the directory that you've got your source files in and it's kind of mapping it in a shadow way with another folder. So does that make sense? You can do a link between Wherever you're working, it can be C colon or uh, C colon dev, you know, and you're working in a folder in my theme folder. You can link that with any DNN instance, portals underscore default underscore, I mean, uh, slash th uh, skins underscore my theme name. And you can link that, but it's doing shadow copies, but it's never actually copying the files over there. The files just reside in your source directory that you're working out of, but it gets reflected there. So it's kind of like a ghost mapping kind of thing uh, that, that they're doing, but it's a pretty powerful thing that a lot of people don't know about, uh, but we use that quite a bit. That way we can, we can just run another make link command to point it to another DNN instance and we can make an update there and it just automatically shows. That makes sense. Any questions about that? That's probably a little geeky there, but uh, we're good? All right. So those are really kind of the, the ways you can do it. The, the other method, the third method really is, um, it, like for instance on a Mac, if I'm developing the theme on a Mac, I obviously can't run DNN locally on the Mac. So I'll just develop on the Mac, 
I'll run a command to package it up and I'll just install it on another DNN instance, you know, up on a server or a test server or anything like that. Um, that's another way to do it. That tests your package to make sure everything, your install process works good and all that as well. So there's definitely pros and cons to each approach. With, with this, you can really use any uh, editor that you want. So if you love Visual Studio Code, you can use that. If you like Sublime Text, you can use that because we're really working with just HTML, CSS, JavaScript kind of stuff here. So there's no need to load a fully integrated development environment like Visual Studio full. Um, but uh, I, I personally work in code, but you can really do whatever you want. So let's go ahead and set up as if we were going to develop a new theme here. So what I've done is I'll pull up Finder here. I've got a, a folder here called, you know, I just created a, a, a folder in my um, dev folders here, but I mimicked, this is kind of a trick that, that I do with this because one of the interesting things with setting up a, a tooling like this, containers is handled in a different directory structure than skins, right? Hey, Timo, I know we, we've talked about this, right? <laughs> It'd be so, so nice to, to see all that come together. But um, part of our build process needs to actually put the container files into the containers directory instead of the skins container, but you kind of want all your source together. So one of the tricks that I do when I set it up, if I'm, this is a new theme, I'm gonna call it, you know, I'm gonna have it under this DNA connect root. I go ahead and mimic the path of the root, that, you know, from the root where it's gonna be. So portals underscore default skins, and then I create a name of a folder that I want to develop in. Well, I've got this in here as a backup. This is another one. So if something goes wrong with the internet connection here, I'll be able to flip over to that. But, You'll see I only have one theme in there right now. I'm gonna create a new one though, but I'm gonna do this from the command line. So I'm just cloning the repository that's out here on GitHub. So if I come to our GitHub, go to the code tab, you'll see here the cloner download. You can grab this URL and copy that if you're using the command line, or you can just download the zip and extract it to the folder of your choice. I'm going to use the command line here. So I've copied that. I'm gonna to go to my terminal now and I'm already in this skins folder here. So you'll, and I've got finder open here too so you can kind of see it happen here. But I'm gonna run git clone and then I'm going to paste in that URL that I grabbed from git. This is gonna clone the repository this should go fairly quick because there's not, not a whole lot of files in here. All right, so it's already done. You'll notice that up here it created a folder called MV Quick Theme. At this point, I can really just rename this folder to whatever I want it to be because you probably don't want to call your theme MV Quick Theme. Uh, we'll just call this demo. I'm going to rename this to demo oops, theme one. All right, so now we're good. So at this point, I'm going to do some, I'm gonna change into that directory, do my theme one, and you'll see there's all my files there. I'm gonna go ahead and launch Visual Studio Code from here, and just, I'm gonna load this directory. You could also start up Visual Studio Code and open the folder. Uh, either way is fine, I'm just doing it quick from the command line. All right, now we've got our whole environment already ready to go with this. So all I really have to do at this point to get going and building is come over to my command line. Since I've already installed Node, I've already installed NPM, I've already installed Yarn, I can just type Yarn here and return. Now it's going to, at this point, get all the dependencies from this and download those and put them into the proper places, get everything wired up. Um, this is the same, if you're familiar, I don't know, how many are familiar with Yarn? Okay, um, how many are familiar with NPM? Okay, so this is the kind of the equivalent of running NPM install, if you're familiar with that. So it's really just making sure you have all your dependencies downloaded and so forth. 
It'll take just a little bit longer and we'll be ready to go. Internet's been pretty good here, so I'm pleased with that. And you don't really have to understand what all is going here, but if you've been watching Visual Studio Code over here, I did not have a node underscore modules folder before. Right now, that's what this is doing. It created this node underscore modules, and here are all my dependencies it just downloaded. Uh, dependencies not in the sense of um, what's going to be packaged and is required on the server, but it's more what tooling we're using here in our development environment. You'll never really come into this folder and touch any of that. So it, just think of that as the kind of the black cloud behind the, behind the scenes that's enabling you to do the work. Everybody with me so far? All right. So now I have set up everything I need to do in this project. Let's say I want to go ahead and build this. I can run, I should probably come back over here and go through this, see how much time we've got. Okay, we're doing good. Um, over here in the wiki, you'll notice that after this installation, you've got the project set up. This is where you're kind of controlling the metadata. So you're going to want your theme to have a name you're going to want it to have your contact information in it that you're doing. So if you're building it for, to put it on the store to sell, or if you're doing it for a client, you want to definitely put the name of things in there and the version of it and all that. Normally you would do this in the DNN manifest file, right? Well, with our workflow here, you never actually have to touch the manifest file. It automatically gets generated for you and so forth. We're just going to put in the pertinent information. You can go and edit more stuff in the manifest, but there's really no need to at this point. So we're going to go and we're looking for this project-details.json here. It's right in our root. So I'll pull this up. Is I should make this bigger. Is that a, everybody see that okay? Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, by default, we've got this in here, so I'm going to rename this DNM Theme 1. Uh, this is our very first version, so I'll make this 1.0.0. This is just me developing it, so I'll put me in there. This is our company, um, URL, sure, I'll put this in there. And yeah, that sounds like a good email address. I'll put a DNM Theme. All right, I'm going to save this file. And at this point, I'm ready to build it. So I'm going to run one of these main commands of Gulp commands. And by the way, if you're over in the wiki, after you do the project setup, you can go to commands here. And these are the main dev commands. It's Gulp build, Gulp watch, and Gulp package. So build is doing exactly what it says. It's building everything and actually making it usable if you're developing it in line with DNN, you could actually assign the theme at that point and so forth. It's building it right there. Uh, watch is something we'll cover in just a minute. It's a very cool feature that's going to really save you a lot of time. And package is actually going to build and put everything into a distributable package to install in a DNN instance. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and build this and we'll see what happens. Gulp build. Now at this point, you're going to see a lot of things happening here. So you can imagine, I mean, we're, we're doing, C, uh, we're using SAS here. So I don't know if you're familiar with SAS or anything. Don't be scared of it. You don't have to know SAS. We've set all of it up for you. Um, but it's really just kind of CSS on steroids. It allows you to do a little bit more uh, programmatically with it, use variables and things like that. We'll cover some of that in a minute. But it's compiling the CSS. It's minifying the CSS. It's minifying all of our custom JavaScript that we're doing. It's moving everything into the right folder structure. Quite a bit of stuff there. It's updating our manifest file and all that. It's actually built. Uh, you saw it happen really quickly there. If I open up Finder now, you'll see that, I, or I can actually do it from code here so you can see it a little bit better. There is a disk folder now that is created, all right? Within the disk folder, We've got all of our CSS, so it actually provides Bootstrap minified, Font also minified, and then he, there, there's our custom styles in a minified form already there. We're not going to modify any of these files directly, 
this is our distribution for us. This is the kind of the end, end product of where things are going to be. Um, but you'll see all of our JavaScript, you know, bootstrap JavaScripts there, any of our custom JavaScript, which we don't have much. Again, we're trying to be performance focused. We've got as little work in here done as possible to do all this. David, yes? What's the reason you don't combine those three in one file? Um, well, it's a good question. Um, but in the end, we're using the client dependency framework, so they will be combined. Right. Yeah. But we wanted to keep them separate to make it clear what's going on here. Yep. Yeah, I'm not using the client dependency framework for that because I have issues with it, so that's probably why I do And we, we've ran through issues as well uh, with, with the client dependency right. framework. So there's definitely some work that can be done on that side. But in the end, we're looking at this is what we can put right now there, and we're loading that stuff appropriately using, using that. But they're still segregated as far as the code goes. Ultimately, they're going to be packaged together because we're using the client dependency framework in the scheme. Okay. All right. So we're now actually ready to go. If I had a local DNN instance, I could actually load, you know, refresh DNN. I could assign the theme to it because it's in the proper folder and I can start working and uh, see the changes right there. Um, so uh, uh, at this point, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Gulp Watch because that's another big one. What Gulp Watch is, it's, it's literally watching for any changes to the appropriate files in this package and as it makes, as it detects a change to the file, it automatically runs a lot of these process commands that we've created to make sure your build, your distribution is actually keeping live. So you don't have to build it every time you're ready to see a change. You can just run gulp watch. This will spin up a process. And then anytime I come in here and actually modify any of the source, here's my main theme folder. If I wanted to make a change there, then I can name this banner pane one instead of banner pane. I I should probably pull up this in another window here. So I'm going to try to save this and flip back over. So you see it's starting the watch. All right. When I save this, you'll see that it actually picks up. Did I do that right? Oh, you might change the CSS file. Yeah, the CSS. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Good point. Uh, yeah, not what I need there. Okay, so... I'll come into source. We'll go over the architecture of this, but let's say I want to change something in, we've got all this architected really well, but let's say we want to change the color of something. So instead of E6, E6, E7, I'm going to change the light gray color to the seven at the end. Oops. I'm going to save that. So you'll see over here, it already started the SAS compiler because it detected a change to the CSS and it's done a notification that is compiled properly and now that the output CSS is already there in the build folder. So I'm literally making a change to a file, refreshing my page and it's there. So you can, you can see how that's gonna save quite a bit of time working with this. Okay, I wanna speed it up here just a little bit because we're getting close to time. I'll go back and check over my notes. Okay. So um, we covered setting up the project uh, to make sure the manifest, I probably should show you some of that. Uh, the manifest here is right in the root where you would expect. And I don't have code set to color code all this, but you'll notice it has the name in there. It has a project name based on the company name that I put in and the theme name, um, the description in here, our contact information and everything else is pretty cookie cutter to handle the way we've got the files architected and how it's going to ultimately distribute that. All right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill that gulp process here, or gulp watch. All right, so let's go over the architecture just a little bit so you can get your head. Um, a lot of people, when they open this, they see all the files and they're like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of stuff to learn. Some of these you, really can just ignore. For instance, docs. This is our documentation, so some people like to have that local, so we provide that in markdown format so you can see that, but there's no reason why you need this in the actual theme. It does no, no good there, so we, you can delete this folder. 
All right. Um, the disk folder, you're not modifying any of that directly. The node modules folder, you're not modifying any of that directly. Your containers file is actually part of the, um, the, the build process. Well, actually, it's, you can modify this if you need to update your container. We've got a basic container in here that's stripped down with no real functionality. Most people are using no title stuff these days and not doing a whole lot of fancy stuff around it. But if you had other containers that you wanted to put in here, you just drop the new ASCX files in here, put them in, and you're ready to go. It'll automatically detect all of the new uh, containers and update your manifest file and all that accordingly. Your main skins or theme files are here. So we've got one here that's used for out of the box, but you'll notice that we use a technique to include some, we call them partials, um, in the sense that if they're little widgets, like if you want the same header across the entire site, then we do that in the header, ASCX partial, and we just include it into the main theme file here. So it keeps things nice and clean here. Uh, we've got several content panes in here, but you'll notice that we're using Bootstrap here to, to style all of this stuff. We really put this in here as just uh, showing you some of the best practice for doing, doing things like this um, to be able to handle the responsive nature of things and, and all that. But you, could, of course, can do anything that you want. The only requirement is the DNM requirement of having one pane that's called content pane. Other than that, you can do about anything you want to. Uh, notice the we've got some includes here and some registers. Um, the registers are, and I'll just go to the registers file, you'll notice it's in a folder called partials. So the registers ACX, and by the way, we use an underscore naming convention for all the partial files to indicate that it is a partial. It's not a something intended to use by itself. It's not a theme file. It's just something we're including in multiple theme files. Um, so the registers, what you'll see here is a list of every theme or skin object that exists in DNN. Um, some that are used more often than others are, you know, you'll recognize, but some of these, you may not even know that they even existed. They are literally there. For instance, how many of you knew that there was a toast skin object to do notifications? Probably didn't know that. It exists. It's not in any of, like, it's not in the 10 pound gorilla tool out there, but it does indeed exist. So that's a great way to add toast notifications to your themes. You can just uh, uh, reg you know, use this register to, to do that. So you have fun looking through some of that. You may see some things that you may never realize was even there. Uh, would, I mean, some of those in here, like the left menu, people really should not use. I would remove those, to be honest. So they exist in the framework. So our no, philosophy no. was that we're going to make them available. The, the conversation of whether you should or shouldn't is another, it's outside of the scope of this tool. Notice our themes do not use all of these skin objects. There's reasons that we don't, uh, that you're alluding to. <laughs> but they're here nonetheless. All right, you want to make a pull request to it, make a case for those to be out of there, I'm happy to it. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and some of these are really left over from a long time ago as well. You just take, you know, you, you just put them all in, but, you know, some of those actually should be ripped out of the core, in my opinion. So in your case, you know, you, you would add your... 40 fingers style helper, you know, one here. Uh, very easy for you to update the registers here and include that in. So it's not limited to what you do. You still can put in custom theme objects and so forth, but we just put everything in a nice organized fashion. And you may want to do custom registers in another file just to keep those separated from the core register, you know, registers. Uh, includes, this is where we're actually using the client dependency framework to appropriately load all of the CSS and JavaScript that's included in the theme. You'll notice most of this is for Bootstrap and uh, Font Awesome, but we have one CSS file for our theme at this point. We have one JavaScript file for, for the theme. Um, everything else is Bootstrap or Slim Menu or Font Awesome related. Mm -hmm. Just something because I'm not that uh, big of a femur yet. Um, I was always told like use uh, CDNs. Is that a bad thing or do you So you can actually use CDNs with the client dependency framework. Um, okay. 
I'll be happy to talk about that in more detail and why you would or would not do that. Um, I'm sure you could probably answer some of that too, uh, but it doesn't necessarily work the way you would hope that it works. But in general, CDNs are good, but remember you're, you're impacting the performance of the site as well. Our philosophy here is to actually include Bootstrap with this, include Font Awesome with this, not download it from a CDN because it's going to take longer to download it from somewhere than it is reading it right from the server directory. Thank you. Yeah. Makes sense. So it's kind of a philosophical question uh, a bit there as well. Header is very simple here, but we, this handles our logo and our menu and our search bar up at the top. And you can, of course, adopt any kind of architecture of the code that you want here. We're just giving you a starting point, a way to organize things. We, we like the way it is, but you may not. You may want to do it com completely different. So there's all of our partials. So I'll go back to the main theme file. So we're including those three partials there, and we've got a footer partial at the bottom. Everything else is nice and clean. I mean, how many themes have you purchased or created yourself where the actual theme file is just it's horrendous, right? You're doing inline styling. You may use the frame, a CSS framework here at some point. You may not use it here. You're just getting the job done, right? Please consider not doing that because these frameworks help optimize things and doing things this way will really, really help. Also increases your productivity in doing this. If I needed to create a new pane here and create the layout a little bit different, if I don't want a two column layout here, I can simply, you know, modify, copy that, paste this down here, change this to double pane one, three, or whatever naming convention you want to use. And then I just use the bootstrap to do a four, four, four to equal to 12, you know, 12 grid system, 12 column system. I'm done. I've got now a new content pane in there and I've got a three column layout content instead of a two column. So this just kind of helps you and you know, I didn't have to worry about the container or a row inside of a container and all that kind of stuff. It's just kind of the models there for you already. All right. Um, any of, uh, I probably should jump really now because we're almost to the end here. I uh, thought I was going to go quicker with all this, but uh, the custom JavaScript is here. We only have one snippet really in here where we're using direct jQuery here uh, to handle the slim menu. Uh, setup of that and then we have no images in this because of course you're going to want to provide your own images for the theme so um, you can do that one thing I will mention one of the commands is actually optimizing your images for you as well so it's a gulp process that runs optimizes the images for you so you can literally use this tool as an Im image optimization image optimization tool only if you wanted to throw a bunch of images into the image directory, run a, one of the process commands to do that, and it'll optimize all your images and put them in the disk folder. So that's alone is a nice time saver. And that is pretty much the architecture of everything. Um, any assets you might like Bootstrap or any other dependencies you want to put in there, you can put in the assets folder. All of your SAS is in here. We are unfortunately not going to have time to really dig into SAS at this point, but Again, you don't really have to know it, but you can kind of tell here, oh, I need to change some colors in my theme. So, oh, that looks like somewhere where I can change colors. So I come in here and I can change whatever I can make. These are variables in CSS. So um, you just change it once and it permeates through any time that you use that style uh, in the theme. So change your primary color to whatever. Uh, you'll notice where we've got these variables that are, or, that are used in the appropriate areas to use those colors and all that. So um, make quick changes in one place and done. So any kind of uh, breakpoints for your, your media query, you know, for uh, the mobile responsiveness to it or any of that, you just change your widths right here for your breakpoints, all in one place, nice and clean. Any spacing that you want to do. There is some more complicated stuff going on in here, but uh, um, updating your fonts that you're going to use. We include Open Sans and Helvetica by default in here, but you can do whatever you want to in here. And these are some of the, uh, this is really just loading all of the, the variable SES files. But this is our base one. 
So most of the CSS work that's even in here is here. So this stuff you'll recognize is pure CSS really for the most part in here. Um, pretty good. Nice and clean, not too long. Make the updates here and you're good to go. Again, we're trying to keep it as lean as possible. So let's jump right to packaging this up and making sure we've got the zip file. So I would run gulp, package, enter. And this is going to run gulp build, so you don't have to do gulp build and gulp package. Gulp package just takes it the extra step of zipping everything up and putting it into a, an install package. So now we should be able to go into Finder. And you'll see what happened, by the way, I forgot to mention this, but when we ran gulp build before or gulp package, you'll notice the containers folder got created automatically and the appropriate theme name is in here and there's our, our container you know, for, for that. But what you'll see here is once we ran the package, there's actually a build folder that was created and we have our zip file right here. Named appropriately for our theme name, the version number, and underscore install to follow the naming conventions there. So we can now take this and either install it in another DNN instance or use it there. So you see that, I mean, we spent a lot of time on some of the details, but as far as quickness, clone the repository, run yarn one time, build, modify a few files for your layout, for your, your colors, your fonts, package it up, send it out, you know. Any questions? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the skin.css, there is no skin.css. We have default.sx. You can name it whatever you want to, uh, but that's right here. So if you needed more, so let's say you wanted to create one for home, you wanted to create one. For I mean the skin.css file, which is sort of how it's not mandatory. Are you um, loading another one with clients? So yeah, the, this, this right here yeah. is your, you can kind of think of it like that. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Um, but in the end, if we look in our dist folder, CSS, everything is right in there. So you don't have skin.css anymore. Oh, you, uh, you don't have to use that. Oh, I thought you had to. Yeah, see, this is the old paradigm, right? Uh, it's, it's there. And DNN will use skin.css if it exists, but if you tell it not to use skin.css, How do you tell that? uh, that's you done in the manifest. It's not there, it's not there. Ah. Right, as long as you're loading it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to tell DNN really. You just have to make sure you're loading that CSS into your skin. Sure, yeah. yeah, which is happening in our includes. You know, it's pulling it through the client dependency framework and loading that. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, just sure. uh, um, till now I've had only one experience with SAS and my problem was always that uh, when I changed uh, uh, SCSS uh, file, then it needed to compile right. to the full version. Does go do that for you? That's what it's doing during the build process? Like, I and always... The watch. Mm -hmm. no, the watch. The watch is doing, which ultimately is using the build process, right. yes. Because that was always my problem. I was literally scared to change something right. in the uh, files because I could change yes. it, but somehow I couldn't get it to... Uh, well, that's the thing. If, if you're purchasing a third-party theme or you're building your own and you want to use SAS, you don't have an environment set up, so you would have to actually know how to set it up for SAS to run a SAS compiler. Yeah. It's not too hard, but I mean, it's daunting for, well, you know, not... I didn't have anyone else to learn it from in, my, in the company, so yeah. I was like, how am I gonna do this? But this actually. Well, you can also use Koala. Yeah, yeah you can use Koala, which is yes. the Windows application that does that for you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, yes. I don't know all of that, so that's. Yeah. So much cool. I mean, if, you, if that's the only thing you want to solve, you just install Koala, say yeah. that's, a, that's a folder to watch, and it can yeah. start watching it for you and compile. Yeah, because I know how to code in SAS. Like, yeah. it's pretty easy, but just the compiling of everything. That yeah, it's well, either this or Koala, yeah. or there are other tools too. It's magic. <coughs> Well, yeah, to me it, it is last year. Yeah. I was like, how have I got to ever do this? It's yeah. not going to work. Well, you'll write a fraction of the code yeah. 
you know, from if you were just writing pure CSS, you would have to have so much more. Yeah. And that's the benefit, you know, of yeah. using SAS to really handle some more complex scenarios without writing a ton of, of code. But do do go out and check out some of the commands. I mean, these subtask commands and process commands alone are really nice. A lot of those are actually happening with either the build or the package command, which are the main commands. But you, like I said, you can do things like images, you know, just optimize all your images and run that command alone if you only want to deal with that. Um, so it really can be used for a lot of different things. And there is some more information and stuff about how all of the, the thought process is for the SAS files and all that so that you can familiarize yourself with how it's, because it looks like a lot, but it's really, it's just separated out and more simple for each thing, so. Yeah, I just need to take time for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be around, so if anybody has any questions, just let me know. Okay. Thank you. And that, ladies and gentlemen.